Hi, I'm Kathy Johnson. Welcome to Town Talk. I have with me today uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Leonard C. Yanelli. Uh, uh, he is a proven biology environmental science educator with over 40 years of comprehensive experience in writing, teaching, research, and community involvement. He is also the author of several books, and I want to welcome you, sir, uh, as a very, uh, one of my most distinguished guests I've had on this program as of yet. Thank you, Kathy. You're, you're welcome. Um, I, I, I would like to discuss a little bit about uh, your credentials so that we can uh, set in motion our audience to understand that you just didn't fall off a turnip truck here. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so um, one of the things that uh, really interested me uh, in, in your resume uh, is um, uh, conducted forest ecology research, principal investigator on Isla Navarino, Cape Horn, Archipelago, Chile, 2000 to 2004. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I was on a uh, Earthwatch grant uh, for over four years there where we organized uh, four expeditions to the Cape Horn Archipelago and Isla Navarino. It's really a remote island, uh, uh -huh. <coughs> excuse me, off the coast of, uh, of uh, Tierra del Fuego, which is the large island. Right. And uh, I was there with two wonderful Chilean biologists, uh, Dr. Ricardo Rossi and, and Dr. Masardo. They were a couple. And we were doing uh, biodiversity work in the old growth forest there. And while I was there, I was finding out how the problem they faced with ozone depletion in the atmosphere. Oh, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, um, Dr. Rossi had already had episodes of skin cancer because of the hole in the ozone layer. This is back, again, this is going back about 11, 12 years ago. Right. Um, so they were very concerned about that. They were very concerned about the school children coming out because they were taking them out for environmental lessons. Um, very interesting, they were part native and part uh, Chilean, the school children. Uh, they're of um, Yagan native people were there. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the same people that Charles Darwin interacted with, uh, wow. and believe it or not, in the 1830s, yeah, the okay. descendants. Um, but they were very concerned about the hole in the ozone layer. You know, the uh, chlorofluorocarbons had de were depleting the ozone layer and uh, too much radiation coming through UV. Uh, radiation coming through, and uh, they were having to take a lot of precautions. In fact, with our expedition, we were all mandatory to wear sunglasses the entire time we were there to protect our it, eyes. It, it was it was that uh, it was that bad. bad. Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. gives you an idea that you know these problems that we talk about are really global. That really struck me when I was there, uh, just how global these problems are. It's uh, while we're facing, uh, you know, the, the uh, proposal for dirty fuel. Uh, fossil fuel plant right here in, in Oxford on the right. Naugatuck border, uh, but these pollution problems, various kinds, are all over the world. Yes, yeah. and you know what impressed me about this too was uh, this line here, um, uh, uh, this work contributed to uh, Isla Navarino being declared a biosphere reserve by the United Nations. Yeah. That, that's very impressive. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'd say, you know, our expeditions contributed, you know, a little bit to that. The main uh, kudos go to Dr. Rossi and Dr. Masardo, the Chilean biologists, mm -hmm. did wonderful work. And now that island has uh, some protection mm -hmm. uh, in, in a lot of different ways, particularly the old growth forest. Yes. Uh, now, before we go into the power plant, because that's foremost on so many people's sure. minds, especially uh, the the town, our surrounding towns, uh, to Oxford, and the citizens in Oxford uh, are divided on this issue because of tax dollars. Uh, uh, would there be anything you'd like to add, Professor, uh, to <coughs> let our general audience know uh, that when you start speaking about the pollution and the uh, impact this power plant? Uh, will have on our community that they can trust that um, that that uh, this is just not uh, off the top of your head and and that kind of thing. If I, if you follow me, sure. Well, I, I think it's interesting the little discussion we had before we went on the air that we both worked at Yale University yes. and both did cancer research. Yes. So yes. Uh, we share a lot there, and I was in a colon cancer lab. Uh, you were doing tissue work, if I right, understood yes. what you were Cytotechnologist saying. Cytotechnologist uh -huh. looking for cancer. 
cancer cells. Okay, so we can certainly uh, talk a little about that, um, that type of work. Uh, but, and that connects very much to the uh, proposed power plant because one of the things we're really worried about is soot. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people relate to soot, especially when you can right. see it. Right. Um, the danger we get from this plant is that uh, the particles that are going to come out of it are very, very small. Um, in fact, uh, they measure them in what's called particulate matters, PMs, mm -hmm. and they get very, very small in micro meters, mm -hmm. uh, which you can't see. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the best way to describe it that people can relate to, um, if somebody has more hair than I do, one thirtieth of the <laughs> diameter of a hair is about the size of the particles, which you can't see. Right. But the unfortunate thing, um, we do know uh, that in a power, a fossil fuel, dirty fuel power plant like they're proposing mm -hmm. for um, Tawanic Hills in Oxford, that that material is going to go out over a 10 mile radius and probably even further given the particles are so small. Mm -hmm. And those particles, we will then breathe in unknowingly, mm -hmm. breathe those in and they will enter our lungs. Mm -hmm. And if they're small enough, which we it looks like they're going to be, they'll a actually enter our circulatory system mm -hmm. and go to all parts of our body. Now, soot, while there's no definitive studies, it's the main focus of a lot of cancer research in terms of lung cancer right. uh, and, and other cancers Absolutely. that we come down with. Now, yeah. I, I have a, a question because I know what the population in Oxford is saying about this. I had an opportunity to go to New York um, to visit a similar power plant with our first selectman, George Temple. Uh -huh. And um, I viewed the power plant, and one of the questions was asked, how much pollution will, will this bring into the air? And the answer was, um, not any more that's already, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right. not any more that's already there, or right. <laughs> uh, that, kind, that kind of thing. And yeah. then there's going, and so what's out there now is, a lot of people saying too much misinformation against this power plant. What say you on that? Yeah, well, uh, no, it's, it's very dangerous, and you get these generalities, uh, which is, isn't good. For example, one of the products coming out of those stacks, which are 150 feet high, by the way, yes, um, uh, will be uh, nitrogen oxides, various nitrogen oxides. Now, those are known to cause uh, respiratory problems. Uh, people with uh, emphysema, it's going gonna, it's gonna to exasperate that mm -hmm. problem. Um, people with asthma, which is almost is really epidemic mm -hmm. uh, in, in the United States, it's going to exasperate that. Um, so th that's, um, you know, how much of it and quantifying it is difficult, but they're going to add to it. It's not just going to be what's already there, uh, but they're going to add to it, which isn't a good thing. And we know the type of pollutions we're talking about, and I could do a little bit more on the board here in a second. Sure. Um, that they particularly affect the elderly and they protect, uh, and affect younger children. And, and to give an example, um, to localize this, uh, I was part of a movement in Naugatuck for over 15 years, now 20 years, that eventually uh, resulted in the formation of the Guntown Passive Park and Nature Preserve, mm -hmm. which is right on the border of Oxford. Yes. Uh, I, we could throw a stone to Oxford from that beautiful area. Uh, and we particularly formed it as a place for people to go, particularly grandparents with their grandchildren um, or young mothers with sure, their children. Sure. And, and that's only 1.2 miles. We've measured it on a map. Oh, from, only from, 1 from, the, miles uh, from the proposed plant? From the proposed dirty fuel power plant. So as you can see, we're very much in Naugatuck. Uh, very much in the bullseye mm -hmm. of this pollution. Um, but let me just show you a couple more yes, things on, do, on the professor. board here. Yes, please um, Because there's so many aspects to this. Let's see here. You go um, right ahead. Okay. Uh, let's just start with the coal. Um, with coal, uh, you basically just have carbon, the C standing for uh, carbon, and then, of course, um, oxygen comes into play when things are fired up and coal is burned. Uh, and what results out of that is carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, a gas. We'll draw an arrow up to indicate that that's a, uh, that that's a uh, gas, a vapor. It's going to go into the air. Um, and that is a key problem with uh, climate change, as we know. Carbon right. dioxide is the main culprit 
and climate change. Of course, with coal, many other things come with it, sulfur, mm -hmm. compounds. But we're not talking about that for uh, the proposed Tawana Hills power uh, proposal. They're talking about methane, which is, which is CH4. Um, so this is methane. Will that be in the uh, plumes? Very much so. Well, it'll be broken up, um, mm -hmm. actually, because, again, you've got to show it with oxygen. Mm -hmm. And ironically, you get the same carbon dioxide coming out of it when, it, when it's broken up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you get some water, you get, you know, some water coming up here also. And for the purest, chemical purest, you'd need a two here and you would need a two here. But uh, the point is, you know, we come up with the same climate uh, criminal, you might say, right. you know, when you use methane is when you use coal. So uh, what really bothers me when I read the literature of the, uh, of the company doing this uh, that they keep saying clean, uh, uh, you know, because natural it's gas, gas. Yes, natural. and it's not clean at all. It's it's going to just add to, um, in in big ways, uh, the climate problems. In fact, methane here, which is this natural gas, they're getting this through fracking uh, up north. Oh yes, um, which is also called fracturing, really. Uh, they shortened it to fracking, but it's fracturing the earth. It's sending a drill and a lot of chemicals deep into the earth, um, disturbing things down there to get a hold of the methane. But when they do that, we do know that methane itself, methane, the gas itself, is given off. And they lose, I've seen figures as high as 3.3% is lost to the atmosphere. And we know methane itself, not counting the carbon dioxide, methane itself uh, is a climate multiplier. In fact, I've seen figures as high as 34 times as much a climate a multiplier as compared to carbon dioxide. When you say so, climate multiplier, that means uh, it's, it's even more into the... In, in other words, it's going to catch more radiant heat leading the Earth and reflect it back, okay. basically. Hold on to it. Thank you. Uh, in fact, I've seen there's an Australian scientist that says it's really over 100 times more as a climate multiplier in terms of, again, causing the problems with climate change and global warming. So uh, this is, it's bad in so many ways right here of, wh of what they're talking about. So I'm going to try to migrate back to my chair Okay, here. there you go. Okay. Um, we could just leave that up there and maybe refer to it. That, that sounds good. That okay. sounds good. Um, uh, so what do you say to people when they say that they don't believe this to be true? Yeah, I, I think part of it is, uh, it's interesting to me because I've always found in teaching, it's hard to get across concepts that people can't see. Right. And that's, that's, you know, I know in talking about evolution, um, which is so broadly accepted now, including by the Pope. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> um, we have uh, and uh, I, ha I happened to be at a conference at the University of Oxford in England, and we were discussing this and talked about just how difficult it is uh, for students and people generally to understand evolution because you can't see it right. I I as a process. You can see the results of it, <coughs> excuse me, but you can't see it as a process. Uh, and it's the same thing with this type of pollution. Uh, people could be walking around uh, the Greens in the Twanic Hill area of Oxford or in the Guntown Passive Park in Naugatuck or downtown Naugatuck um, and not realize what they're breathing in in terms of the nitrogen oxides uh, and then all the problems that it'll be causing in terms of climate change. We, shouldn't, we should get back to this because it's such an important point. People relate to it much more now, I think, on our coast since Hurricane Sandy um, because that brought climate the climate problems really up close and personal. Um, these vicious storms that we see, Sandy, Katrina, mm -hmm. um, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico into Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, we do know that uh, these climate changing molecules, they're warming the waters of the ocean. And when the storms come over, they're picking up that moisture more easily because mm -hmm. more of that moisture goes into the atmosphere. And the storms pick that up and they just become more stronger and drop more, and the winds are higher and they drop more moisture. 
So there we get Katrina, there we get Hurricane Sandy. Well, you know, I've always been a believer that you can argue global warming, you can say that it doesn't exist, you can say it exists, but my attitude is, would, isn't it much better to take a conservative approach and protect the climate, whatever which way you sure, believe? Sure, sure. Well, there, there's a very easy answer to that. I mean, I think people generally trust science. I mean, mm -hmm. they hear science and begin to understand some of it, they trust it. 97% of climatologists assert that climate change is happening, 97%. Mm -hmm. So I think we should pay attention I, to the nine. In fact, I investigated. I got interested. You know, who's that three <laughs> percent? Yeah, know? who doesn't believe? Who, who doesn't do that? You know, and I looked at. I found one person, uh, whose name escapes me, unfortunately. But I found one person and found out a hundred percent of that person's grants are paid by the dirty fuel fossil fuel industry. Well, I was going to so, say, follow the money as a uh, politician. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. So I would pay a lot more attention to the ninety-seven percent of climatologists who say. Yes, climate change is happening, and, and I might add too. Uh, I have relatives out west, out west, to tell me about the droughts and the wildfires, sure. and that there's so much more, so much more intense. In fact, uh, some of us were on the climate march. Maybe we could talk more about that at some point. Sure. And on September 20th, 400,000 people marched in New York City, um, uh, opposing. Uh, climate and saying we got to get going with uh, renewables, renewable energy, uh, which of course this proposal in Oxford is the exact opposite right. of that. Uh, but while I was there, I found out there was a delegation from Oklahoma, and there were 24 people. And, we were, and, and they said, you know, we very specifically sent 24 people, and we began wondering why did they send exactly 24 people? Well, we found out 24 people were killed in their town. When oh. a particular vicious storm that flattened houses, we see those occasionally on television, as you know, right. uh, that flattened houses and actually killed 24 people in this very small town. So when we say, you know, these storms are particularly vicious and people are understanding, and that's why we had those 24 people from Oklahoma, you know, on the climate march. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that, now that brings me to a situation here with the power plant. Um, so many people uh, want to see this coming because it represents tax dollars. And of course, uh, the criticism has been, and this I don't want to get into too much politics on this because we have more important things to talk about. But uh, it, there are people in Oxford that say, well, if the surrounding towns were getting tax dollars, they wouldn't probably turn their back so much on this. Um, uh, I would like to just touch on an issue here where, and I believe this myself, that this is a done deal. That um, once it's at that siding council, there's powers that be politically, in my mind, that if, if this is written in stone somewhere, many chess moves ahead that we can't see, all the screaming and yelling in the world isn't gonna help. I do remember when we first heard about a power plant 15 years ago in Oxford, uh, my husband who's with the land trust, uh, but of course land trust isn't political, let me say that, but he's a member of the land trust. Uh, uh, I was, as I said, first selectman for years in Oxford and, and all. I just didn't think it fit the town. It didn't fit the rural character. And as much as I'm not an aviation expert, and I'm not an expert like you are on pollution in this, I have to say to myself, it's a perfect storm. There we have a quarter of a mile away a proposed power plant from an airport with a gas line and a power line, and planes do crash up there. So as, a, as an individual and a layperson, that was my concern. But am I wrong in thinking that this is a done deal? Is there any hope for this? Yeah, well, I was gonna say, this is one thing I'm gonna disagree with you very strongly. Uh, no, it's, it's, not only a done, it's not only not a done deal, it's, it's the fact is those people opposing this plant and supporting renewables are winning. Um, I was just at a press conference along the Naugatuck River uh, just, just this past Saturday representing four different environmental groups. Uh, it was the Naugatuck Environmental Network, which itself is made up of three environmental groups. And let's see, there was a representative of the Valley Audubon was there. Mm -hmm. Very much grassroots. Uh, the other three committees were the uh, uh, Naugatuck River Revival Group, the Committee for a Cultural Environmental Center, Guntown Road, that 
made possible that beautiful park we have on the Oxford Naugatuck border mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. um, and the Naugatuck Land Trust. And each group made a statement relative to their uh, thoughts on this, and all were opposed uh, to this uh, Tawantic Power uh, proposal for uh, dirty fuel uh, mm -hmm. energy. Uh, so it's very much a grassroots upwelling. It's not just in Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the point I'm trying to make. Uh, and, and, you know, what's very important, too, and I don't want to lose some of the uh, physics involved in this here, the Tawanek Hills are 700 feet above sea level. Um, and the Naugatuck Valley is 500 feet at, at our, actually our highest point going through the Beacon Falls area. You're probably mm -hmm. familiar with that with Route 8. Sure, The Naugatuck yes. River is 500 feet above sea level. So this area where they're building the power plant is already 200 feet above where yes. we are. And they're going to put up two, two smokestacks 150 feet above that which means it's going to be 850 feet mm -hmm. in total height above sea level, where Naugatuck, Naugatuck Valley at its highest point is 500 feet, which means that when those pollutants come out and that soot comes out, which we're really worried about, which is the carbon, mm -hmm. um, it is going to come right over into the Naugatuck uh, Valley and, and throughout the Naugatuck Valley as the winds, and I know how the winds work there. Sure. Um, and it's going to go uh, you know, up and down the valley. So. Uh, we're very concerned, even beyond the 10-mile radius that you usually hear about, uh, especially since the carbon that we're talking about is so small uh, and is going to travel a long, long way and is going to be invisible. Um, well, that's you know. the thing. You, you, don't, you don't fear what you don't see, right. yes. Right. Uh, now, th there are those who say that this is a much better power plant than the first proposal. The stacks yeah. are lower. <laughs> uh, 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 can yeah. you address that? Do yeah. lower stacks make yeah. any difference? Uh, no. No, in fact, uh, Catherine, you might remember back in the 60s and 50s, they kept building those stacks higher and higher uh, uh, to try to defa uh, defy the laws of gravity. Sure. But what we knew is that what goes up also comes sure. down. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and it may not come down right away, but it's going to come down somewhere. Um, and that's why so many people are up in arms against this proposal, not just in Oxford, but throughout so many towns, Southbury, Middlebury, Waterbury. Uh, oh, I, I should mention uh, uh, the uh, Western Connecticut Central Labor Council uh, is supporting the Naugatuck Environmental uh, Network and oh, its efforts labor. opposing this power plant. Now think of that. Yes, now, when I say yes. we're winning, yes. when you win labor, you know, people, the, the, some of the very people who might get jobs out of this, although we found out investigating this, there's only really 20 jobs that would have any sure, longevity sure. to them, and most of them would be specialized jobs coming from out of state. So here we have, um, and I happen to be, I was there. Uh, we sat down with electricians, and, you know, there's, uh, I know that at least there were pipe fitters on that uh, uh, labor council, um, and, and construction people in construction, and they understood in a unanimous vote that they don't want their union members to be going home no matter where they work uh, in, in around this area, which is, uh, we calculate is going to hit at least 45,000 people are mm -hmm. going to be affected by what comes out of these stacks and into the water, which we haven't even touched yet. Well, I wanted to um, talk. We will get to that, and yes. This, and these trade unions have said, no, we don't want that, and we're going to support you in your efforts to oppose this power plant. So when I say we're winning, I'm, I'm not just uh, uh, running at the mouth, as they say. thinking. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, there are groups upon groups, including, uh, I think, very important groups, which, which the Western Connecticut Central Labor Council is a very important group. They cover our entire area. Well, uh, they're opposed to this. Now, well, now you've got my attention, because yeah. when I saw labor unions represented up at the uh, presentation of um, the CPV people, uh, that sent a flag up to me because I thought if labor's getting so involved in this right. and they're a push, if, if this is going to be all that many jobs and they're pushing hard, they have a big lobby. But th this, uh, this, this uh, angle of it is very, very interesting. Right, right. So um, I, I'll give you more and more examples sure. of that same thing. There's always a group here or there, just like you get the 3% of climatologists that are denying climate change, 97% sure, sure. are supporting, you get a small number that will be in labor that think 
that they're somehow going to get a, a, some crumbs out of this deal. Right. Uh, a good example on the national scene would be the Keystone XL pipeline right. coming down from Alberta, Canada. Yeah. Um, the vast majority of labor understands that and realizes that we do not need tar sand oil, which is some of the worst uh, polluting type of uh, fossil fuel you can get. It's extremely dirty. It takes a lot of work to even get the oil out of the sands. Uh, it's extreme extractivism up there in Alberta, and we know pipes break. Mm -hmm. Right? We know pipes break. So the Keystone uh, X XL means fast track, basically. They're trying to fast track this uh, tar sands, filthy uh, fossil fuel down from Alberta right through uh, our country uh, and get it down to Louisiana, pipe where pipelines are already built, down to Louisiana, and actually ship it out. You know, and I might add, too, with the methane that they're talking about producing here, we've got to understand the groups behind this. The uh, Pincus Warburg group is a venture capitalist group. They're behind the competitive power ventures. Mm -hmm. Competitive power ventures has a, uh, an office up in Massachusetts, but their headquarters is in Maryland. But what people don't realize, there's $37 billion of assets behind this whole thing. Mm -hmm. These are multi-billionaires, multi-millionaires that are behind it. Um, in, in fact, hedge fund money is involved from Brazil, from India, and Asia. And you could bet that this group is not just depending on shooting uh, electricity from this utility plant just to our grid. Oh, no. Oh, in yeah. no way. Yeah. In fact, there are in proposed in Connecticut right now, let alone the Keystone Pipeline out, you know, out in the Midwest, there are five pipelines, large volume pipelines being proposed. Now, what do you think those are for? Those are for piping it down to the coast, oh. where they have ways to deal with these gases and ship them, liquefying and shipping mm -hmm. them. And you could bet that the, uh, you know, the uh, Pincus Warburg group has its, has its sights on making millions and billions of dollars. They're not interested in generating electricity for me and you. They're interested in making big profits. And this is always the way uh, to follow the money, and that's what I meant by right. chess moves ahead. Right. And, and, uh, and uh, for those, um, uh, it, it, this, uh, explain a little bit about CPV. What's their, what's their role in this? They just build the plant? Well, yeah, yeah you know? I think they're the construction and all right. of that. But they're, they're a very political animal, you, you have to understand. In fact, um, I was talking to a friend of mine in Bethlehem the other day. Now, Bethlehem, mm -hmm. right? Um, he said he was surveyed by this person asking them, would he support clean energy up in Hartford? Because, mm -hmm. you know, once if, if this, whatever's ruled on the siting council, it would go to the legislature to be codified. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how that, that works. Yes. Um, and so they would need votes there. And so they were looking for this person to sign a petition for clean energy. Now, this person was erudite enough to say, well, what type of energy do you mean? Is this renewable or non-renewable? The person said, no, this is methane. This is a fossil fuel. And, and this person said, no, no, thank you. I don't want to sign that right, petition. Right, right. So you see, the, it's very, uh, uh, they're a political animal, mm -hmm. CVS. They're doing that type of an activity. Uh, so they're really a front group. You know, for this venture capital and hedge fund mm -hmm. um, to to try to make a lot of money uh, for this venture. Well, capital you know, group. when they they when they did their little show in Oxford, and I went, it was I expected a room full of people with question and answers, and when I got there, it was just little presentations at tables, oh, which sure, yeah. which was done purposely, probably. Sure. Right. Uh, you were talking about the water. Is the Naugatuck River going to have gray water? Right. Because right. I'm being told by a lot of people in the know in Oxford that that's, that's um, a fallacy, that that's not so. But maybe that's not exactly so. But what, what would you say, <laughs> Professor? No, there, there's so many aspects to the water. Um, in fact, let's start at the other end. Where are they going to get the water to run this? You have to have a large, you have to have tens of thousands of gallons of water a day. Heritage. Uh, to to her yeah. To get this. So they're looking at the Pomparag River. Yes. Okay. So if they were to run it under methane alone, it would take 58,000 gallons a day, a day, out of the Pomparag River just to be able to clean things, clean the stacks, mm -hmm. all, that, all that goes into that. That's an, an enormous amount of water. 
right. to take out every day. Uh, now, as it was originally proposed, it's, it's actually gas and oil. Yes, People it is. People don't realize. When, when, um, and let me interrupt. When I was mm -hmm. in office, I tried gas. I couldn't pull the permit uh, because they would have sued the town. Uh, but um, uh, what I tried to do was uh, get the siting council to say they didn't need an oil backup and they shouldn't have it. I was trying that, but let's go to the oil. Sure, sure. So with, an, with uh, the oil, they would need a million gallons a day from the Pomparog River, I mean, an enormous amount to keep, try to keep things oh, clean. Oh, wow, wow. And of course, oil we know is yet another dirty fuel. Right. Uh, now, uh, a number of things here. We shouldn't be fooled by the oil thing, because one of the uh, political tactics uh, that is used by um, uh, CPV, Competitive Power Ventures, is that at, when this thing comes close to the siding council, they pull the oil mm -hmm. to make it seem somehow now cleaner. Mm -hmm. oh, and, oh, we're not going to use as much water, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. And then what they do is they up the wattage. They'll say, okay, it was going to be 805, I think, megawatts. 805. Now, well, because we're dropping the oil now, maybe you'll allow us to do 1,300 megawatts. So they'll make even more money, you see, and try to make themselves seem cleaner by dropping the oil. That's a very typical tactic. They have used that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're going to have to be very aware of that in the siding console. It has to be very aware of that tactic that they that they use. That's just going to be more of everything: more pollution, more methane, more, you know, uh, more of everything. Uh, so, um, and what's very instructive for us now, the Pomparog uh, River Watershed Group, mm -hmm. okay, originally supported this proposal. Yes, yes. And I think there were some crumbs involved for them in this. Mm -hmm. They have now come out against the. Uh, CPV proposal for a dirty fuel power plant in Oxford. Right. That's extremely important. So now, what are they going to do for water for this plant now that the people along the I see. main so, so voice is against it? So gradually, the clay feet are crumbling on uh, this statue. Absolutely, and a lot of other feet are mobilizing. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, yes. So, so when I say we're winning, you know, and when I talk about a labor council or watershed groups. Uh, the Naugatuck River Revival Group. Now let's go to the other part of the water. What would happen to this gray water? This, um, and uh, uh, what the Naugatuck River Revival Group would say, Kevin Zack, who heads that up, and, and uh, Sandra Harmon, who heads that up, they talk about gray water effluent. We cannot find out what's in that gray water. We are not getting a straight answer, just like you didn't get a straight answer when, about I went the, up. when you went up into New York. Uh, what's in the gray water, the effluent? And all we know is it would be piped to Naugatuck. Here we go with poor Naugatuck again, which had to deal with all those terrible pollutants back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I could talk more about that if you'd like. Mm -hmm. um, now we're getting this gray water being sent to our sewage treatment plant. It's not even our sewage treatment plant. It's another multinational <laughs> corporation that owns it. Uh, and we know that with storm surges, you get water that bypasses and ends up directly in the river. Oh. Okay. So that effluent, some of it, will end up into the river. And we don't even know what's in it. And the fact that it's gray alone has <laughs> got to tell you <laughs> that there's pollutants in there. And, and think about all the work that uh, the Naugatuck River Revival Group, uh, Kevin Zach, Sandra Harmon, and so many other rivers. There's other river groups, too, that I'm not mentioning. Going way back... Uh, to clean up this river. Now, I'm old oh. enough. Oh, so am I. In, in, I was okay. born and raised in the valley. Okay, so uh, okay, so I was born and raised in Waterbury and, and went through Naugatuck many times and didn't have to. And you worked had to hold Thomaston, your nose. Worked in Thomaston and I saw those multicolored uh, water going by us. Uh, in fact, I could add to that. Um, in the late 60s, early 70s, I worked for the Thomaston Junior Senior High. Mm -hmm. And I used to take my classes down to the Naugatuck River. And we used to take water samples out. Now, I used to take my chemistry class down to get water samples, take them back to the lab. It was so polluted with nickel and, and other heavy metals, we didn't even have to order <laughs> the chemicals for the students to test in the lab. We got them right out of the Naugatuck River. Oh, my goodness. Because Plume and Atwood, if you remember that company, was right yep. on, on the water. And talk about what people don't see. Now, Plume and Atwood is long gone. Yes. And, and luckily, the river's a lot cleaner, not only because of the absence of those metal shops, but because, again, a lot of good work done by a lot of good people, including a DEP. Mm -hmm. um, 
So all, all that all that happened. But when when I used to take down um, biology groups down to the river, we never found anything alive except one fish that had a growth on it, and we we brought it back to the classroom and tried to help it out, but it also died. There was nothing living in that river. In fact, by 1970, it was declared a dead river. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, a lot of us know it firsthand, as, as, as you do. Oh, and yes. And I know from taking samples out of it. Yes, there was um, no doubt about it. Right. So you can imagine, and now that groups are organized, and again, it's not just the NRRG. It was many river groups. Uh, Trout Unlimited, for example, has done a lot of work along the Northrop River. They will never put up. With the, the and will not put up with a proposal such as uh, CPV is putting forward. Well, this groundswell is way greater than it was when uh, we first dealt with the issue. Right. Uh, allow me to take a minute to just explain sure. my, my situation sure. here. Uh, being that I'm going to run for office again, a lot of us fought so hard with Jay Halpern and his group and the lawyer. We fought very, very hard to stop this power plant. A few elected, a couple of elected officials had chances to discourage this, and they didn't take it, and I voted against it. At this point, I had given up. I had said, this is a done deal. How do I tell the citizens they can't have tax money that they feel we need? Sure. Uh, I, I still, I'm still against this plant. I don't want it. It doesn't fit our town. We, it shouldn't be here. But this gives me new hope, new hope. Uh, uh, that, that maybe the people are starting to see what we knew 15 years ago. Let me give you more hope. Uh, okay. I mentioned the five pipelines that are proposed for Connecticut. Mm -hmm. that, again, people don't see them yet, but they're proposed. Mm -hmm. um, the Sierra Club has created a anti-pipeline group. Wow. And it's on Google+. Plus wow. And people can sign up for it. If you search uh, Sierra Club and Google+, mm -hmm. Plus, you, you will find it. I've just joined it, uh, and they're adamant at preventing those pipelines coming through. Mm -hmm. uh, now, again, all these are nails in the coffin for this proposal because if they're going to look for eventually to pipe some of this stuff out and make more money by, by uh, selling it elsewhere besides putting it into the grid, um, it's, there's a good chance the pipelines are not going to be there right? Uh, because right. of all this organizing that's going on by the Sierra Club, and Connecticut Sierra Club in this case. Yeah. Can I play a devil's advocate with yeah, you a little? Yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. I'm with you on this. Mm -hmm. But there will be people that say, we have to break away from Middle Eastern oil. It's the safety of this nation. It's something that we have to do because we don't want a world war. We don't want our nation to be unsafe. We want to stay strong. And they'll use that as a reason. And I sit down sometimes and I think, if I were the President of the United States, what would I do? Well, the one thing that's got us locked in, in this world is the fact that we need Mideastern Mid oil. Mm -hmm. And maybe we just can't get to the natural resources fast enough. I'm going to challenge you a little on that. It might not be your expertise, but it's a thought as just a regular citizen that I think of once in a while. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's, it's like, uh, um, let's keep doing the same. You know, when you keep doing the same thing over and over again, there's a definition for that. <laughs> it's called insanity. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes. So we should keep on polluting because we keep on polluting. Uh, yes, that's almost really yes. saying the same thing. Yes. Uh, obviously, we should go to renewables. Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, it was very interesting in the, the, uh, uh, my local newspaper, regional newspaper this week, mentioned Southbury is looking at taking a capped landfill and putting uh, a host of solar panels on it mm -hmm. to cut into electricity costs for the town. I think that's the type of thing we have to look at. Well, we uh, did that no on need. one of our schools. Oh, yes. And Naugatuck has one on one school. But we need to be much, we need to be, we need to be much more creative and much more uh, aggressive with our approach. And we need politicians like yourself uh, to do this type of thing. Um, we have politicians in Naugatuck that look at economic development, but uh, we have to get them to look at renewables right. as, as a way out. And we're seeing, I'm seeing in Naugatuck uh, renewables pop up, uh, solar panels pop up on rooftops all over the place. But they've got to make them more affordable it's for the gotta public. It's got to be, right, yes. right. 
And it's not fair to the people who can't afford these things exactly to say, sorry, we're going to give you we're going to give you a dirty fossil fuel. In fact, even the people putting up the solar panels on their houses in Naugatuck, they're still going to be breathing the fossil fuel, uh, dirty fossil and fuel pollutants. And once again, follow the money. Right. Okay, right. follow the money. Right. That's right. And I'm so glad you mentioned the international scene, though, because that's so, so important. It is. Because um, think about it. I mean, they keep saying, oh, let's keep producing the oil here. But their plans are to, to, to export this stuff. That's what Keystone is all about. Well, my so husband it's, it's says that lie. all the time. It, yeah. it is an absolute lie. They just want to uh, do this extreme extractivism, whether it's tar sands or fracking sure. for methane. Sure. And, and they want to just make a lot of money. It's not about generating energy. Mm -hmm. So they're lying to us in that respect. That, that I, and to dovetail on that, I would say, too, that um, uh, it was, uh, oh, let me see. I, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, but... Um, uh, it's uh, it, it's. I lost the I lost the thought. Okay, I'll well, go back I, I to you. I could come up with a, a okay, ten go, more. <laughs> all right, go right ahead. Uh, you know, it was interesting for me in the climate march, mm -hmm. the type of groups that were marching. You mm -hmm. know, in in some of the things we should be concerned with, there were people there that were marching from uh, the neighborhood Ferguson mm -hmm. in St. Louis in Missouri, mm -hmm. and we were trying to figure out well why are they marching in a climate march? Well. What happened is, is that apparently a lot of the military hardware that's being used and experimented with in Iraq and Syria and in Afghanistan um, is it, what they get it, they get it left over or mm -hmm. it becomes a little bit antiquated. It's being sent to our police departments. Now, I don't know about you, but knowing history and knowing what happened in Japan and in Germany and Italy. Sure. And I'm, I'm of Italian descent. I mean, so I know I. some of those stories. Yeah. Uh, I get very worried when I hear about the militarization of our police. Sure. Uh, that's not a place for a free country to be going to. No. Uh, so I don't think we should be sending military hardware to our police. And I saw the pictures uh, on the news and in the newspapers of, of the police going into Ferguson. It looked like an, invas an invasion force. Yes. And that scared me. Yes. That scared, and that then began realizing, connecting the dots, why the Ferguson people were in the climate march. Uh, because they're now realizing it's these wars, these resource wars that are going on in the Middle East and in Afghanistan right. and elsewhere that have a lot to do with how this, this, um, this military equipment ends up in the cities. Right. So there's this whole connection. That's why peace groups were marching in right. the climate march. Right. Because they, make, they connect these dots. And, of course, it comes full circle when it comes to the fossil fuel industry. And, and, and you know, yeah. I'm con on, on the issue of connecting the dots, yeah. how do you connect the dots with this, this, this power plant in, in a remote place that most people in the United States haven't heard of? Oxford, Connecticut, 14,000 people. Uh, we had the anthrax crisis. That happened in our town. Who yes, knew? That's right. Uh, yeah. That was my first day in office, right, by the I way. Right, I read that. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so the long and the short of it is, how do you explain to them how important is this one power plant yeah. in the big yeah. picture? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's extreme. We're ground zero in the fight against the dirty fossil fuels and really against the whole thing of fossil fuels and the wars and the militarization of the police and all that, all those dots come connect. We're ground zero. That's why thousands of people are going to show up this Thursday mm -hmm. at 6 o'clock at Oxford High School when the siting council is, going to, is conducting hearings mm -hmm. and hearing from people. And let me tell you more about, about being uh, optimistic okay. in a number of ways. Um, I testified before the siting uh, council once about four, three, four years ago. Uh, there was a proposed wind turbines for Prospect, Connecticut, right? right? Uh, on the Prospect Naugatuck border, in fact, mm -hmm. another border, mm -hmm. our other border, uh, going uh, east from Naugatuck, as I'm from Naugatuck. Mm -hmm. um, so I went up there supporting it, uh, along with a lot of other people from Prospect. But there was a well-organized group in Prospect. They'd be called NIMBYs, I'm sure, you know, mm -hmm. not in my backyard. Yep. They came out in force. Right. And they apparently strong-armed, or at least the siding council felt the pressure from them, and they voted against siting wind turbines there, all right? So they voted down wind turbines just a few years ago on the Naugatuck 
Prospect border. On the basis? They're certainly not going to tell me and other people in Naugatuck that they're now going to put a dirty fuel fossil plant <laughs> on Naugatuck Oxford border. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be adding insult to injury. Um, so, again, there's a history here, um, and uh, I'm going to be there Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I know other, a lot of other people from Naugatuck are going to be there. The Naugatuck River Revival Group is an intervener, official intervener. So, they're mm -hmm. going to get. Um, uh, to be able to hear longer testimony from them while we're very concerned about this fossil fuel plant. So a lot of dots to connect, and yes. people are connecting them. Well, yeah. I, I intend to walk Woodruff Hill. I'm going to be there that, uh, on the 15th. I'm 3 o'clock. Yes, at 3 o'clock, and I'm going to also uh, be at the siting council. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to jump into this fray and get very active against it now. Uh, I, I have to say that I was waffling a little bit. My history in town is that I've never wanted this power plant, never did want it. Uh, even criticized my own administration for giving GE a, a tax deferment and um, <laughs> voted against that at the town meeting. Yep. So right now, I, I, you give me more hope because I have to say I was very pessimistic. Uh, 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 about the situation. The other thing that had slipped my mind was, uh, I remember we used, we were saying when the first um, plant was proposed uh, yes. uh, that uh, fuel cell technology uh, could be one way to go uh, for future energy. Uh, um, that was another thought that people had. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know that much about that and I do know we offer a course on it, or did, at Nogatuck Valley Community College. So we have people uh, trained in that. Um, I think we've got to look very strongly at solar, wind, uh, geothermal could come into play when it right. comes to home heating. Right. Remember, we're just talking about electricity. We're talking about utility as a utility sure. plant. There's so many other areas. <coughs> Excuse me. But mainly we're focused right now on utility plants because they generate 30% uh, of the uh, climate mm -hmm. uh, pollution uh, gases to the atmosphere. So that's why there's such a big uh, concentration on yeah. them. And, and you know, Len, uh, I got the little uh, the little note from my son there, who oh, okay. is, is okay, who is um, part of it. Yes, right. we have about eight more minutes okay. or something like that. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I would like you to tell us, give us some some um, PowerPoints here, some some little bullets. What should what how do we separate the fact from the fiction, which we just did? And what are the important things for Oxford as citizens to know and all the surrounding citizens to know about fact and fiction, sure. if you could just summarize? Okay. Yeah, some more facts. Uh, you know, when you were, when you were um, mayor, mm -hmm. uh, it's mayor, I would think, for selectmen. Yes, right? it is. For yeah, selectmen. Yes. Uh, Chief of police, too, at the same time, you know. Wonderful. <laughs> well, anyway. Small town. Because yeah. you were only about 6,800 people then. That, yes, 7, that's 000. right. You are now 15, over 15,000 people. Well, I'm not sure if we hit over 15, but we're pretty close around Knocking that. on the door, right. Uh, when yeah. Otley uh, contracted the anthrax, there were about 10,000 people in Oh, town. it's grown since then. Yes, it it's certainly has. Since then, yeah. Yes. So that's a whole different deal there. Um, I, I would say, you know, the most important thing is, is just some little basics here about methane being a, a climate multiplier. And people relate to that now with the super storms, just to sum mm -hmm. up. Uh, and even, even the extremes. You know, a lot of people don't realize, Catherine, in our neck of the woods, we're supposed to get, yeah, we're going to have warm summers. We're going to have colder winters. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize that we're at, you know, it's climate change. It's not just global warming. It's climate change. We're actually going to get colder mm -hmm. in the winter. Um, and we know that our temperatures since the Industrial Revolution, the past 200 years, the, our, our temperature is up 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that may not seem like much, but that's causing us major problems, the superstorms and all the other things we're talking about. We're projected to go to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit if we stop everything now at fossil fuels. We know what's going to happen there. And let me give you one fact that we haven't talked about. We're going to get migrants from all over the world. It's already happening. There are already migrants coming from some of the smaller islands yes. that are very, very, you know, that are at sea level practically. The Carteret people um, off of, uh, in, the, in the Pacific, a series of islands, they now are getting storms because the water is more swollen 
with this heating up of the oceans. The storms are sweeping over their island and then retreating. Now, even when the storms retreat, what happens is their land is getting salinated. The salt is settling on their soil, and they can't grow crops. They now are migrating into um, Papua New Guinea, the much larger island. And I've seen a film. It's called uh, Sun Come Up. If anybody ever gets a chance, chance to Google it or get a hold of that film, Sun Come Up, it's won awards. It shows those people going around in uh, Papua New Guinea asking the people for land because what they know how to do is grow crops. These are people that don't even use money back mm -hmm. on their island. Mm -hmm. So they're the, the first climate migrants. But if, when we go to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, we are going to get millions of migrants from coastal areas because our coasts are going to get inundated because that's where the majority of people in the world are on coasts, mm -hmm. whether it's yes. China, Vietnam, yes. Brazil, the United States, that's where our people are. So, so there's going to be, including in Oxford, including Naugatuck Valley, we're going to get migrants now, not just from the resource wars, that's also happening. People from Iraq and Syria, of course, fleeing from the disaster that their countries are with these resource wars. Right. We're going to get these climate migrants now. Well, you know, that's interesting because it's like a boat sinking. <coughs> uh, Excuse me. Uh, everybody starts going up to the higher levels, the higher levels. Mm. And it, it, mm. it looks like the United States and mm. a lot of uh, surrounding areas are, are, are going to be where the people are coming. And, and right. there, there's another problem. Right. It, it, yeah. It's amazing, Len, how, how we're a web that's connected through right. every single yeah. thing that, that happens to the world. I, I'm of Greek and Italian ancestry, and I know that how Greek people think. They just don't look at here. They look all the way out as far as you can see. They're, a lot of people are more interested in what's right in front of them at the moment, and they don't think far ahead, yeah. you know? But um, just a plug for the Greeks and the Italians yeah, yeah. there. I remember something about Greeks, too, at their uh, funerals. They always ask about the person who passed. They ask... Uh, did they live with energy? Yes. You know, did, did they live with energy? And yes. So you're not going to have a problem with that one, Catherine. You don't think so, Len? <laughs> Running for mayor again. And well, well I've, got the, I've got a lot of energy. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I, this is probably my last hurrah. I'm 67 years old. Um, we have a few more minutes to wrap up. Yeah. I yep. want to... I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh -huh. I want to thank you for taking the time sure. to be on this dinky little cable show here sure. <laughs> that I, I've put together. Uh, I'm going to get this. I want the folks out there to know that I'm going to get this out on YouTube today so that it's going to air on Friday at 7 and Sunday at 5. But by that time, we would have been to the Siding Council, which is the 15th. Everybody remembered the 15th um, at the um, Oxford High School. Uh, what time? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. I would get there early because you have to sign up if you want to speak. And I would say to anybody that wants to speak, uh, al allow the people who really have some in-depth things to say about it, say it. Get up and make sure that you have your facts and not fiction and state your state what you have to say as quickly as possible. Uh, and um, Oh, two more minutes left. Now, I'm not that good at this, so do I sign off now, Mr. Engineer out there, or do I just say goodbye to our audience and thank Len? Wait? Cut, cut it now? <laughs> hey, that's all right. <laughs> okay. We're, we're, we're yeah. on tape. We don't right. mind. Okay, okay. Um, well, Len, again, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time and... Um, I'm going to get this out on YouTube today so that people can have an opportunity to go online and see this interview before we go to the Siding Council meeting. Thank you so very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.